Now, I think it's natural for most of us to just assume that if you're going to follow Jesus, that it's going to be smooth. Uh, or that you're going to follow Jesus and people are going to cheer you on. People are going to support you. Or it's, I think it's natural for many of us to believe that if you make a big decision, that you're going to obey God, maybe it's a big step of faith, well, things should be smooth. Things should be easy. Things should be comfortable because I'm obeying God, right? I'm, I'm doing the right thing, so why wouldn't things go right? Well, what I've learned is that when I make a decision of faith or a step of faith, it usually is about 50-50 if it's going to be smooth or, or easy. I'll give you an example. When I was a uh, youth pastor, one of the um, incredible opportunities I got to be a part of was helping start and run a leadership training program for middle school students and high school students in partnership with a local school district. It was just an absolute God thing where our church was invited to come into the schools and operate these programs and provide mentoring and training uh, for young people. As awesome as that was, it took a lot to get there. And let me tell you, behind the scenes, there were a lot of roadblocks and a lot of challenges. It was not smooth and it was not easy. For many years, myself and our church and our youth team had desired to be in the school system because we knew that, that serving in the school district is, is how we were going to advance the gospel and reach young uh, students. But everything we tried didn't work. I mean, for years, we would try to hold meetings with uh, the principals and administrators, and, and we wouldn't even get a, a call back or an email back. Or, or we, we walked into the office one day and just asked if we could have a meeting, and, and we were denied. Sometimes we tried to just bless the teachers. We'd come in with coffee and donuts and say, we just want to bless you. We want to encourage you. But none of that opened a door. And in 2016, things got really, really dark in this particular school district when a young middle school student uh, died by suicide over spring break. And it just sent the school district into a dark place. Parents were angry with administrators, administrators were, were blaming other people on the school district. In fact, there was a news story uh, done uh, on the contentious school board meeting that happened in that season. It culminated when a group of parents um, called for a prayer gathering during spring break and the people of the community, hundreds of people of the community showed up and walked in prayer around the entire campus of this middle school. And so there was all of this, this, this darkness in this uh, school district. And then God opened just a little, little opportunity of light. I had no idea that someday we'd be helping run a leadership program, but at that time the superintendent of the school district invited myself and my team to provide grief counseling for the students, and so we stepped into that. Then I was invited to serve on a, a committee that was going to rewrite the student code of conduct and address some of the bullying policies. Then we were invited our team to provide um, supervision for the lunch hour. And then after a year of being faithful with these small steps, the school came to us and said, we trust you. Would you start and launch a leadership training program for our students? And of course, we said yes. But it started with these small steps, and there was a lot of resistance, and there was a lot of challenges along the way. And so the message I want to share with you today is that big decisions for Jesus often come with big challenges. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to take a step of faith, you're going to face challenges. And nobody knew this better than Mary and Joseph. And so we're going to look at this story, this Christmas story, and see how Joseph had to make a really big decision. Mary and Joseph knew that there were going to be challenges, that it wasn't going to be smooth and easy. Mary knew that her decision to carry this baby out of wedlock meant that she deserved to be put to death. Joseph knew that there would be shame there would be a tarnish on his reputation forever for his future. And so with all that impending reality, with all of everybody else's opinions and their reactions, we enter into this story, Joseph's story, where Joseph has a decision to make. And so let's look at our text here, Matthew 1.20. It says, but after Joseph had considered this, in other words, He's thinking deeply about this. He has a lot on his mind. He's thinking things through. He's, he's weighing the pros and cons. 
You know, I can only imagine he's going through the cons of staying with Mary, the pros of staying with Mary, and ultimately the cons outweigh the pros, and he decides he's just, this is too much drama for him, and he's going to move on. We read in verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So Joseph decides to walk away. But he's an honorable man, so he decides he's not going to make a big scandal, he's not going to make a big public disgrace, he's just going to divorce her quietly and, and be on his way. But then the Lord intervenes. Look at verse 20. After he considered all this, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, fear not. Now, the King James Version is the version that says fear not. The version we're reading continues like this. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, notice verse 21. It's so powerful. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And then Joseph wakes up. And at this moment, you got to imagine that the pendulum in Joseph's mind just swings back and forth. His emotions are ping-ponging back and forth. You know, like on, on one hand, he's thinking, wow. The people of Israel have been waiting for a Savior, and now God has told me I get to be a part of this historical event. But then on the other hand, Joseph's probably thinking, well, what are people going to say about this? What kind of reputation is this going to bring? What's this going to cost me? On the one hand, he can possibly change the world. On the other hand, he has no idea how difficult this is going to be. Everyone around him is probably saying, too much drama, too confusing, just walk away. So what should he do? He has a fundamental choice. Joseph has to decide, is he, is he going to do what other people approve of, or is he going to do what God has asked him to do? And I promise you, as a follower of Jesus, that is a decision that you and I are going to have to make repeatedly, again and again and again. You're going to be confronted with a decision to obey God or do something easier, and that is do something for the approval of people. Why does this matter so much? Well, this is the the, the big thing, the main thing that I want to share today that I hope that you will remember today is that becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. This is so important. I want to say it again. Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. And this is just a fundamental human trait. This is a human truth that if you are a human being, This statement is true for us. And it's been true throughout history. For example, I recently learned about a story from a man in the 16th century named Hugh Latimer. And Hugh Latimer was a Protestant reformer living in England, a very dynamic preacher and gifted speaker. And he would often be invited to places to preach the gospel and preach the word of God. And one day... Latimer discovered that in the audience that he had been invited to speak in front of, in that audience was King Henry VIII. Now, if you know anything about history, King Henry VIII was a pretty wicked guy. Um, He just was evil, he was selfish, he was violent, he put people to death, he banished people, he imprisoned people, He, he was a very violent person. And so Hugh Latimer has this internal struggle where he has a great responsibility to preach the word of God, But he knows that the message he's going to preach is going to offend King Henry VIII, this very powerful person. And so what is he going to do? Well, I want to read a transcript from history of how Latimer preached this sermon. This is what history says. As he began his sermon, he said, Latimer, Latimer. I guess it was okay to speak in the third person then. Latimer, Latimer. Do you remember that you are speaking before the high and mighty King Henry VIII, who has power to command you to be sent to prison, and can have your head cut off if it pleases him? 
Will you not take care to say nothing that will offend royal ears? He then paused and continued, Latimer, Latimer, do you not remember that you are speaking before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, before him and at whose throne Henry VIII will stand, before him to whom one day you will have to give an account yourself? Latimer, Latimer, be faithful to your master and declare all of God's word. And so Latimer faced a choice. Would he preach what a human wanted to hear? Would he preach out of fear of not offending a human? Would he preach what God had commanded him to preach and honor God? And so Latimer chose to honor God, and he preached a message that was very offensive to King Henry VIII. Now, King Henry VIII did not have him arrested. He did not have him put to death. But King Henry VIII's daughter, Queen Mary, did murder Latimer for his faith. Even with all these great examples throughout history, self-preservation is a part of our DNA. It's just a human thing to obsess over what other people think about us and try to earn their approval. And the reality is, for most of us, we drift toward wanting to please people. Whether consciously or subconsciously, we, we want to be liked, we want to fit in. And so we ask questions like, will this make me fit in with them? Will this make them like me? Uh, what do they think about me? What are they saying to their friends about me? You know, when you're in middle school, it's, it's not just important to fit in, but it's also really important to not stand out. Can I just blend in? Can I not stand out? Do they like what I'm doing? Will I get into their friend group? Do, do what they think I'm doing is right? And suddenly, without even meaning to, we surrender to the opinions of people at the expense of living to please God. And so I want to ask today, how do we overcome that? Remember, Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. But I have good news. And this good news is so powerful. The opposite of that statement is true as well. Becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what people think about you. I want to share an idea, a concept with you that maybe you've heard before or it may be new to you, but I want to introduce the concept of living for an audience of one. Living for an audience of one. Living for an audience of one says, God, I want to please you with everything that I do. If God's the only person in your audience, then it doesn't matter what other people think. This is the quickest and the best, and maybe it's the only way to grow out of trying to win the approval of other people. And here's the bottom line. When you think about it, you can't please everybody. If you try to please everybody, you're going to fail somebody, and you end up going to please nobody. We can't please everybody. If you're at work and you've got a, a moral decision to make, you, you're faced with an ethical, moral decision, and if, if, if you make this decision, it's going to cost the company money. Now, you're not going to please everybody. Because on one hand, people are going to celebrate you for doing the right moral thing. On the other hand, someone's going to criticize you for costing money or bringing a bad reputation on the company. Or when you're at school and you're with a group of friends and, and they want to do something that you know is wrong, are you going to go with the flow or are you going to say, no, that's wrong? Now, some people might celebrate you for standing up. Other people will criticize you for breaking up the friend group or, or bringing drama into the group. The bottom line is you can't please everybody. I know this is so true. In that story I told about working with the local school district to form that program for students, one of the first things that I was asked to be a part of was I joined a committee of parents and teachers and administrators to rewrite the student code of conduct and address some bullying policies and procedures in discipline in the school. And I remember going to the first meeting at the district offices and man, it was tense. Like you could just feel the tension in the air. And I knew that wherever I chose to sit would speak volumes about my loyalties and my opinions. Um, I knew if I sat with these parents, then administrators would make some assumptions about me associating with those parents. I knew if I sat with these teachers or with these administrators, then some of these parents would criticize me for sitting there. So what did I do? What could I do? Well, I chose to sit with the school resource police officer. 
because I knew if I'm on the side of the law, I'm on the right side. No matter how hard you try, you cannot please everyone. But the good news is you can please God. You can please God. You can live a life where God looks at you and he says, you did good. I'm pleased with you. You can even live a life where God will say to you one day, say, thank you. Thank you for obeying me. Thank you for sacrificing. Thank you for serving So the question that we ask today is how do we overcome living for what everyone else thinks? How do we overcome living for everyone else? Well, the answer is we surrender ourselves to living for an audience of one. Because becoming obsessed with what God thinks about us is the quickest way to be set free from what people think about us. You see, when we serve an audience of one, We don't have to impress God. And I want you to hear this clearly. I think there are some of us who have, whether from our childhood or in our psychology, we have an invisible audience that we are trying to perform in front of. And whether you're aware of it or not, your emotion and your behavior and your life is directed by this invisible audience, as if you're on a stage under a spotlight. And whether it's a parent from your childhood or or a coach or a teacher, someone who is influential that you wanted their approval, you're, you're performing to win their approval and to win their applause with your life. When we serve an audience of one, Jesus, there's nothing to prove. Because Jesus proved everything. When he died on the cross and when he rose from the dead, he proved his love for you. He proved his power over sin and death. So we've got nothing to prove. So when we serve an audience of one, it's all for God's honor. It's all for God's glory. It's not to earn or to prove anything to him. It's to celebrate him. When we serve an audience of one, we are set free from what people think about us. Think about the early apostles in the church. Peter, James, John. Paul, these early apostles, multiple times the apostles were pulled aside by powerful leaders and they were instructed, stop preaching about Jesus or else you're going to get beaten, you're going to get flogged, you're going to get put in prison. And all they had to do was follow the rules and they could live a peaceful life. But what did they do? Look at Acts chapter 5. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. They chose to serve an audience of one. Now, I want to be really clear. Serving an audience of one does not give you permission to be rude, to be mean, and to make enemies out of other people. See, what Peter's saying here, he says we have to obey God rather than human beings. But Peter did not make human beings his enemy. The Bible tells us that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against human beings. Our fight is against spiritual forces, against spiritual powers. And so this does not give us permission to not be kind, to to not be humble, to even serve others that we may disagree with or may be in conflict with. And and I believe that in our culture, especially in in the Western world, in the United States, we have such a foundational, fundamental um, individuality and independent freedom that sometimes when, when we take a stand or when we make a decision that's unpopular, a decision of faith or a decision based on God's word, there's a little bit of us that wants to get rewarded for making that decision. And then we get upset when we suffer the consequences of our decision. Like, hey, I should be honored and recognized and, re- and rewarded for, for obeying God. Well, these, these apostles, they took a stand and they were beaten They were flogged, they were put in prison, they were tortured, they were ultimately put to death, and they celebrated that they were found worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. You can't please everybody. You can't be honored by everybody. But we can humbly and obediently honor God. And so I want to give you two big thoughts today. And and these two big thoughts are under this this title, this subtitle, How do, Do We Live for God Instead of People?, Two thoughts. I think it's important that we get these two thoughts. First, pleasing God often means disappointing people. Pleasing God often means disappointing people. If you're not ready to be criticized for your obedience to God, you're not ready to be used by God. Trust me on this. I've seen this. It's been a privilege 
in my ministry to, to help mentor and work with many young people over the years. And I've seen several young people who have felt God calling them into vocational ministry. Maybe that's to be a church pastor or a missionary or to work with children, um, but to, in this vocational calling. And I've seen many times where they feel passion in, in, in this calling from the Lord, where they face criticism, even by people who are closest to them. I've seen parents tell young people who are called into ministry, hey, that's nice that you want to do that, but you need to get a real degree, you know, or you need to have a backup plan if that doesn't work out for you. I've seen some get criticized by their friends, well, like, hey, you know you're not going to make a lot of money, you know, how, how are you going to survive in this economy with that kind of career path? They face criticism. And even if it's not a vocational decision, I've seen Christians face criticism um, like those who want to go on an international mission trip. They feel prompted to travel overseas and to serve with a ministry there. I've seen them criticized by people saying, that's too dangerous. You're risking too much. You know, you've got responsibilities here. You know, going to a, a different country is too dangerous for you. And, you know, Pastor James and I, we, we see this even here in a context like this. Anytime that he or I were to preach about God's word and, and the Bible's sexual ethics, it's not uncommon to notice somebody in the audience who is visibly disagreeing with what we're saying from God's word. And it's also not uncommon to not see them again after that because they disagree. I don't want to offend anybody, but I love the people that I speak in front of too much to not share the word of God, to not share the truth of God's word. Because God's word reveals his desire for you, his best plan for you. You can't just please everybody. We have to honor God, an audience of one. Joseph and Mary were simply obeying God. They were just trusting God's word. I mean, just think about all the different ways that Mary and Joseph would be criticized. Think about all the people that would publicly disgrace them, didn't want to associate with them. Maybe some relatives who'd want to cut them off. I mean, because Mary's like, hey, I'm pregnant and it's God's. Like, how does that really hold up at Christmas dinner? Um, or Joseph, think about how this might tarnish his reputation, his uh, his ability to be employed, you know, people whispering, hey, you know, that's not really Joseph's baby. It's a huge disgrace. And I don't know how it's going to play out in your life. But there's going to be a time when you're reading God's word. And God's word tells you to do something and it is unpopular. And if you obey, you're going to be criticized. Or you hear the voice of God leading you to do something. You might be a, a student and you want to obey God, and you decide you're breaking free from the, the party scene. You've decided to follow Jesus. You're not going to get drunk anymore. You're not going to use drugs anymore, and you're going to go and obey Jesus. Or you're in a dating relationship, and no matter what's in your past, you've decided that in this relationship, you're going to obey and honor God with your sexual integrity. Or you, you're with your friends, and you say, hey, your friends, you, you guys were going to go on this big trip together, but you've decided to take that money and invest in a, in, in a ministry effort or go on a mission trip. And some people are going to criticize you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to say you're old-fashioned. They're going to say that you're, you're stuck up. They're going to say that um, you're, you're, you're too good to hang out with them. Or maybe, maybe you face a second career decision. Do you, wanna, do you know what I mean by second career decision? For some adults, at some point, in your life, for a few adults, there is a decision where there's a second career decision, where you feel God leading you to make a decision that is outside of the career that you've been in your whole life. It may require training. It may require education. It may even come with lower pay. But it's the second career that God has put on your heart because he's calling you to it. And you may face criticism for that. People may say, hey, you're just too old. Why are you doing this? Or this is too much of a big risk at this stage in your life. Like, why would you do that? Or maybe... Maybe you just decide to live beneath your means. You know, you, you have a healthy income, but you decide, I'm going to live beneath my means so that I can give generously. I recently heard about a news story in our area about an Indianapolis man who saved up all of his money. I mean all of his money. Not, I mean all of his money. Terry Kahn lived in a very modest house on the south side of Indy. He drove an old Honda. And get this. Even in the 21st century, he did not own a cell phone because he thought they were too expensive. And so when he died in 2021, 
He continued to save money because he didn't want to spend money on an obituary in the newspaper. Everything that he saved was left to nonprofits. But the problem was when his attorney got a hold of the will in his, in his, in his last wishes, Terry did not specify what nonprofits were to receive his estate. And so the attorney just started calling nonprofits throughout Indianapolis. And 12 nonprofits picked up the phone and said, Yes, we would love to receive a donation. <laughs> All told, his estate donated $13 million to nonprofits here in Indianapolis. And no, they did not call Church of the Crossing. <laughs> you have an opportunity to decide to honor God or to please people, even if it's unpopular. Now, you may not have a millions and millions of dollars like that story, but how is God prompting you to live generously? We just heard about the year-end offering opportunity. What, what might God be prompting you to contribute to that effort? That's, that's something me and my wife have to do this week. We have to prayerfully consider, God, what do you want? You put us in the front of this opportunity. How would you have us respond? Or is God prompting you to invest in our students. Our high school and middle school students have uh, summer mission trips and camps and the youth convention that they go to, and these things cost. And we have several students who don't have the financial means to pay for that whole cost. Would you be called to invest in a scholarship for that where a student's life might be transformed? People may not understand when you make a decision to follow Jesus, but we serve an audience of one. The next thing I want to say is something that I've heard over and over again. I've heard this teaching many, many times, and I believe that it's a true teaching. If you want to make a difference in this world, you will endure more pain than those who don't. If you want to live a life where nobody criticizes you, if you want to live a life where you don't feel your faith stretched, let me tell you what to do. Do nothing. Stand for nothing and have nothing. But for me, I choose to engage in spiritual warfare. I say to our spiritual enemy, the devil, bring it on, because I serve Jesus who rose from the dead. Remember, when we take a stand to follow Jesus, when we obey Jesus, we're not fighting against other human beings. Your fight is not against a boss. It's not against a teacher. It's not against a parent. It's against the spiritual enemy. We're called to serve and love other people, not make enemies out of them. And so we have to pick our fights on a spiritual level. We have to contend in the spiritual realm. And so everything I've done significant in my life or anything we've done as a church has always been met with spiritual resistance and criticism in the spiritual realm. Anything significant is always met with spiritual resistance. And so we have to fight for it on a spiritual level. If you're not ready to be criticized for obeying God, then you're not ready to be used by God. Because remember, becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. But becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. And I want to share thought number two. This is going to help set some of us free. Extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts of obedience. It doesn't start with having a $13 million estate. Like that preacher from England in the 16th century, you may not be called to stand in front of a large audience or speak in front of kings and politicians, but extraordinary acts of God start with ordinary acts of obedience. Think about this. Jesus, the Savior of the world, came to two young Jewish kids who were engaged to get married, and they just simply said yes to what God wanted to do. And you know what's crazy? Could you think about getting inside the mind of Mary and Joseph? Like, think about how little instruction they got. I, I, don't, I don't know if you're a type A, if you're a planner, but think about how little instruction they got. The angel showed up and said, you're going to have a baby boy, you will call him Jesus, and he's going to save the world. Goodbye. And the, no details. Like, what about the details? Like, imagine what Mary and Joseph are thinking. Like, how do we raise him? Like, how do we discipline him? I mean, he's the son of God. Do we spank him? Do we put him in time out? Well, if he's perfect, maybe he'll spank us and put us in time out. <laughs> There's no details. And I think that there are many of us who are held back because of a fear of not knowing the whole plan. You're, you're stuck in fear, and it keeps you from taking the first step 
because you don't see all the details. And so you're praying, God, show me the details. God, show me the plan. Show me the details. And God is saying you can't handle the details because if you knew the details, you wouldn't take the first step. So just take the first step. Extraordinary acts of God often begin with immediate, simple steps of obedience. We don't have to understand completely to obey immediately. Just take the first step. We don't have to see the whole picture. We don't have to see the whole puzzle just to put the first puzzle piece in and trust God. Because the outcome is up to God. The outcome is not up to you. The results are not up to you. What is up to you? Obedience and trusting him. You have no idea what God might set in motion with one simple act of obedience. Think about this coming week, we have our Christmas Eve services. Now these Christmas Eve services, we are going to share the gospel of Jesus. We're going to share the hope of the love of God. And you may be able to invite someone to come to Christmas Eve with you who may not normally be open to an invitation to church, but you may be able to bring someone. It may be just a small, simple step of obedience to invite and to bring them to church. And then I believe that there are going to be people who are saved at these Christmas Eve services because we are praying and we are contending for this. And then their lives are going to be changed. And it's going to change how they treat their spouse. And that's going to change how they raise their children. And their children are going to grow up knowing Jesus. And then their grandchildren are going to be introduced to Jesus. Your simple step of obedience could bring about multi-generational change. You have no idea what a simple step could do. Or when you feel prompted to serve somewhere in the church, Maybe it's in children's ministry, reading Bible stories, teaching Sunday school. You have no idea the, the influence you're going to have on them. Or, or, or you may feel like now is the time that God is calling you to start tithing on your income, just a small portion of it. And you're going to be able to look back and say, wow, we took that small step of obedience to tithe. And look at what God has done. He's multiplied that gift. He's provided for our needs. He's increased our faith. Or maybe God is leading you to make a difference in the life of a child through, through foster care or through adoption and this simple step of obedience. And you're thinking like, how are we going to do this? What about this? What if it costs that? And you don't have to understand completely, take a simple step of obedience. And then you look back and say, wow, look at what God has done. Or maybe you're a single guy and you start coming to church and, and, and you see a, a single Christian girl at church. And then God's prompting you to turn off your Xbox, iron your shirt, brush your teeth, and then ask her out on a date. And then one day, a year or two from now, you get married and have a child and you name that boy Andrew because God helped you get them together. <laughs> you have no idea what a simple act of obedience can do. What kind of chain reaction it can happen. Extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts of obedience. So let's return back to our text here. The angel said to Joseph, Fear not, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. So now Joseph has a, has a choice to make. Does he do what's easy, or does he do what's right? Does he do what people want him to do and get the approval of people, or does he do what God wants him to do? Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. But becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. Pastor James and I often reflect on our experience through the pandemic, starting back in 2020 and, and through. And we both agree that during the pandemic, if you were in any form of leadership, you could not please everyone. You could not make everyone happy. If you worked in an organization with more than one people, there was differing opinions, differing preferences. The only people that did well in the pandemic were those who worked for a boss of one. <laughs> if you were self-employed, you were okay. But what I've realized is that through all the decisions, if we make this decision, these people will be upset. If we make that decision, these people will be, be upset. If we allude to this, if we allude to that, I've learned that in leadership, I want to obey Jesus. I want to stay focused on the mission of Jesus. I want to honor Jesus. I want to be kind to people. I want to serve people. I want to be humble, but I want to follow Jesus, and I want to obey Jesus. See, an audience of one is a theology that's going to help you through the rest of your life. It's not about mom or dad. It's about Jesus. It's not about a boss. It's about Jesus. 
It's not about an institution, it's about Jesus. It's not about a club, it's not about a sorority, and it's not about a fraternity, it's about Jesus. Serving an audience of one sets you free from trying to win the approval of other people. So let's finish with Joseph. Let's see what his decision is. Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. He did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. And through that simple act of obedience, the greatest act of God in human history was brought to fulfillment. Jesus was born. Jesus became the savior of the world. I promise you, you have no idea what one simple act of obedience can do for the rest of your life and the lives of those around you. You can't please everyone, but the good news is you can please God. And so I want to end today by inviting you into a moment of prayer. And I want to invite all of us to respond to the message that we've heard today. And so would you pray with me? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And in this moment of prayer, I want to invite you to pray to God the Father. Say, Father, is there any piece of my life or any relationship or any area in my life that I need to trust you with? or take a step of obedience with? Just ask him that question, and if he brings something to mind, pay attention to it, take notice of it. Is he prompting you to make a change? Is he prompting you to let go of something? Is he prompting you to forgive? Is he prompting you to take a big, bold step of faith? As I'm praying, I also just want to pray for anyone here who something in your past has come to mind where maybe you didn't take action or you feel like you've failed. I want to tell you that you have not let God down. God is not ashamed of you. You did not fail God, but there is more grace for you. There is a new beginning. There is forgiveness and there's a fresh start in Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, we break off the shame that the devil's been using from your past. And we claim a new day for you in the name of Jesus. A new victory in Jesus. For the person here, you may be fighting against a, a secret or there may be a secret addiction in your life that you feel like I'm just not good enough to be used by God because of this. In the name of Jesus, we pray more of his power into your life, more of his freedom into your life. You have better days in front of you. That addiction or that secret does not define you, but you can be free of that because of the love of Jesus. And so has God brought anything to your mind? Has, has he put anything on, on your heart where you need to make a change or take a step of faith? Would you just capture that? And I want to pray for all of us. Father God, I pray for any of us who feel like we've received a prompting or some direction to take or a step to take. God, would you give us the courage to take that step? Would you give us the faith to trust in you, to obey even when it's unpopular? And God, if we face criticism, God, would you give us an internal resolve that the praise and the approval of human beings is not what we're after? But our treasure is set in heaven where moth cannot destroy, where rust does not destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. But we have a hope set on heaven. And so even though we suffer here a little while, there's coming a day when we will be in heaven where there will be no tears, there will be no brokenness, there will be no disease, there will be no shame and scorn and, and reproach. And so God, I pray for all of us that you would give us the courage and the confidence to obey you. And I pray this in Jesus' name.